Be sure to check out MythVisionPodcast.com. Help MythVision grow, guys. Become a Patreon member. You guys will get early access to all of my videos when I'm done editing them. Also, it's a small community where you guys can message me your questions and talk to me in private. You guys can donate also through PayPal. Join our social media links down in the description. We have Twitter and Facebook groups. Help the community of MythVision grow. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Hit that bell button so you're notified every time I do a live video and you don't miss any of my content. Like this video and comment your thoughts below because I want to know what you think about all of these things. We are myth vision welcome back to myth vision podcast your host derek lambert nothing new right well actually there is something new i've been watching this gentleman for quite some time on his youtube channel make sure you guys go down in the description paulo gia and you guys can actually help follow him you guys can help with his patreon paypal you know all the plugs make sure you guys go help him out he's here on myth vision podcast today we're going to be talking about some interesting stuff that a lot of apologists in christianity use in arguing for the resurrection of jesus there's always an apologist argument out there and i've seen apologia on other channels the atheist experience he's been all over the place so Welcome to the channel, my friend. It's great to be here. It's all led up to this moment. I can't wait. So so great. I know. It's all been predestined before yeah, the foundation right. of the world that this would happen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Although it's weird as a materialist, I also kind of think things are, you know, predestined from that initial domino. So it's a weird shift. That's interesting. I know Sam Harris has a strange, uh, but it's, it's in a different vein. It's yeah, not- it's deterministic, not predestined yet. Yeah. So you think pre predestined in a sense? Or? No, no, no. It's just determined. Okay. That's what I kind of thought. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So today we're, I figure, man, we could pick any of your videos and it'll be entertaining. Anyone who has not seen your stuff. I'm sorry. I'm giggling, man. <laughs> your, sh- your shit is unbelievably amazing. I-, I really love the graphic level. You take it. Um, it's a show. It's, it's like, uh, I can watch it like I'm watching TV and really just get a kick and a laugh. You pause it at the right times. You let the people like really hear your argument and you give all the visual illustrations. So I figure if you don't mind, I'm using your video on this video. All right. A commentation. Time, right. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's do no, it. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. I'm even going through the uh, copyright stuff because who knows might be watching, you know, <laughs> All right, let me see something here. We got you here, right here. This is him. This is the that's real the better him. looking me. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, look at the biceps. I saw um Kent Hoven making fun of your biceps or something, trying to say he's not really that big. And yeah, I uh, you know, one of my I've come from the comic book industry. Uh, or I, it's one of my things that I've done. So I'm yeah, I was when I was sketching myself, I'm just kind of used to you know the superhero mold. So sorry about that. Yes. We know you are a superhero, man. Mm. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Let me know if you can hear this. So here we go. Nobody thinks that there were only two resurrection appearances, one to Peter and one to Paul. Nobody thinks that. Um, I do. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Apology. Real quick, real quick. I got to say, are. before anyone who gets into this, it's important they understand that y- they're going to, if they're not following, you, what you're suggesting is this isn't a group hallucination, right? That, that What we're going to dig into is there was probably a single individual, possibly two, who had claimed to see some type of apparition or uh, uh, claimed to have a celestial uh, experience with their God or their Christ figure, Jesus. And it's not like 12 people experience these things. It's not like this large amount of people. So I want people to keep that in mind because what do the Christians always say? 500 saw them and, and, uh, and, and the women, they saw them too. And shoot, even skeptics saw them or, <laughs> you know, it, it just goes on and on. They're using gospels. But uh, anyway, I'll shut up. <laughs> No, no, yeah, Pol- yes, sir. Logia, Apologia. I never know how to pronounce his name. You got me right, Christian. Well, Take a look at the claims of Christians. You- Say what? You, you, you pronounced my name right, so that was great. Yeah, that was why does he do that? You, you always I, super chat him. I think that Cameron, um, I think that's a little dig. I don't know for sure, and if it is, good on him, Cameron. Uh, I disagree with him on 99% of everything, but he seems like a good guy. So I think he's trying to hold on. Right. Um, you see his recent interviews on the the talking about the um, 
exorcisms and stuff like he's I think he's just trying to find anything that's uh, interesting in the in the field, of course, that might have people hold on. But he does seem like a really nice guy and I'd love to talk with him sometime. But, uh, you know, where would you? His interview with his brother, who is who is an atheist, like Cameron got into apologetics because his brother became an atheist. Uh, and the video with Cameron talking to his brother gives a little bit of credence, I think, to what you're saying in that, you know, Cameron is holding on ver and maybe maybe one day we'll switch over versus that he really believes it. So we'll see. Mm, interesting. We'll see. Here we go, guys. Get ready. You've actually interacted with his work on your uh your podcast, you've interacted with one of his videos. He's an atheist YouTuber. Oh, it's nice that I left such an indelible impression on Dr. Craig. <laughs> Last month, I issued a what if challenge to Christians. It was a thought experiment designed to test a particular component of the Jesus resurrection story. And more specifically, the scenario that I hypothesize is the most probable explanation. Sadly, no Christians took me up on the challenge. Perhaps it was confusing. Perhaps it was boring. Or perhaps there simply is no answer to be had. Now, April was Easter month. So there were a lot of resurrection affirming scholars doing live streams and taking questions from the audience. This was my chance to put the challenge forward to the biggest names in resurrection apologetics. Dr. Feel free, by the way, to just yes. say, pause. We got a comment on it. And I, it, maybe it's an important topic, you know? So I, just let me know. Right now, I think it's just really weird that. Okay, so we're responding to my response to their response to another video. I don't know how many levels of inception we are, but it's at least four. So. I know the movie and what was that? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio played in with the, right. the, the dreams. Yeah, we're in some levels here, but I want to talk about it because can you get a Christian to come on and actually talk about this without trying to be defensive? I mean, it's it's like just an open, friendly conversation on your position. Uh, I would like to hear one if you could have one on this particular uh, topic, but I went and reread Galatians last night and I just kept looking at it going, mm -hmm. man, how did we get the, where, did, how did we get to the conclusion that they're drawing, you know? So anyway, I see very, I see a huge rift between Paul is making an argument and it's not the argument like, like what Christians want to say, it's just this positive thing. It's defending himself and explaining why he is uh, the right guy with the right gospel. And it almost sounds like he's defending himself against the Peter and the James guys. He's saying, look, I'm the guy, you know? Right. And I think one of the things that's maybe important for us to notice, just talk about for a second, is that um, my approach is a little bit different than, not than, scholars i actually adopted the approach of scholars and that is when we look at the new testament it's not all garbage uh there are seven letters of paul that are considered undisputed and that you know in general you go to doesn't matter if it's the most secular school or the most fundamentalist school those seven letters are kind of undisputed and galatians is one of those um what is highly disputed is whether the gospels you know, our eyewitness accounts or how those came to be. Um, and a lot of the, like Revelation and a lot of the other epistles and first and second Peter, for example, you know, m more scholars go on the that's garbage uh, side of things. So in my approach, I like to take the seven things that Christian scholars absolutely affirm and accept those at face value. And so uh, that, that's exactly why we're talking about Galatians today, because Galatians is probably so first. Corinthians 15, which has Peter describing his own vision, that's the most important one that the Christians will always bring up because that's their so-called creed that proves the resurrection. But the second most important one is Galatians 1 and 2, which describes two instances where Paul comes to Jerusalem, and in his own words, he meets with some of the church founders. So if you are willing to accept that Paul really wrote those books, by, by fiat, um, I think that's the right word, Anyway, the, you know, Paul, uh, so Peter and G James, brother of Jesus, whether he was biological brother or, um, you know, brother in Christ, either way, that guy, James, who called himself brother Jesus existed, as did uh, an apostle named John. We don't necessarily know which John, but, you know, you kind of have to get that far if you're willing to at least play in the Christian sandbox. Um, and so, you know, those are the things that I kind of accept because I don't, 
I think that the arg my argument holds up very well, even if all that stuff is true. And so I just take everything that the Christian scholars will unanimously say and uh, adopt it for my arguments. That's you do really good. That's exactly what I'm saying. I got a buddy who's a huge fan of yours that that always sends me links to your stuff. So <laughs> he's and I'm like, dude, I get it already in my feed from YouTube. And he's like, no, but watch it. But watch it. I'm like, <laughs> All right, I'll watch it. You do play in the sandbox. So uh, back to the video. Just interrupt me. Let me know when you need to make a comment. And of course, you got my email with the with the topic and just talking about how they want to interpret things and make the meaning mean what they're saying and stuff. But uh, yeah, here we go. Let's do it. Dr. Gary Habermas, Dr. Mike Lacona, Dr. William Lane Craig, Dr. Sean McDowell, and best-selling author Lee Strobel. Unfortunately, the character constraints of a chat box didn't allow me to fully put forth the nuance of a several-minute video. But I think I got the gist across. Here's a question that comes yeah. from a, a apology, I believe, is a, a skeptic. Consider a notion there, that Peter okay. and Paul were the... <laughs> Uh, I just want to say, uh, since this video came out, I actually did have a really great conversation with the, mental, the gentleman who was just talking. That was Sean McDowell, who is probably the world's best scholar on disciple martyrdom. And so he and I actually, he responded to one of my videos about disciple martyrdom, and we both got to go on the Unbelievable podcast, uh, he and I together. So when you're talking about can you be in the same room and have a good conversation, Sean and I had a really good conversation about what does and doesn't make a martyr. So kudos to Sean, who since that time uh, has stepped up, you know, and, and and wanted to address what I was saying. So I appreciate that about him. Interesting. I wonder how yeah. that conversation went. I got to check that out. Yeah, absolutely. Only actual eyewitnesses to the really risen Jesus. Our gospels and creeds would then be legendary stories. Do other lines of evidence exist that contradict such a scenario? So I think he's saying, imagine it's just Peter and Paul were the only eyewitnesses. And then that would mean that the Gospels themselves are legendary. Are there other lines of evidence that would contradict such a notion? Thanks, Dr. McDowell. Yes, that's the question in a nutshell. Well, I'm not sure I grasp the whole question, but... Um, um, Any help, Dr. Craig? I thought he meant that there were only originally two resurrection appearances claimed, one to Peter and one to Paul. Correct. And what evidence would we have to contradict that? Well, yes, all the evidence contradicts <laughs> that. Um, I'm surprised he would ask. I realize that I'm a constant source of disappointment to you, Dr. Craig, but maybe humor me if all of the evidence contradicts it, then maybe we can go through that together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The reports that we have in the Gospels and in Paul's letters, you know. Yeah, but I gotta, I gotta say, I really do appreciate Mike Lacona, especially with your latest video that you did on, right. on him defending. Like, dude, he, I don't even know how he's not. Well, he's very flexible on inerrancy, but dude, he's got to be super flexible. That's interesting. Yeah, his newest video today is is really interesting. It's it's even titled something like, "There are things in the Gospel that are probably true." Is like the name of his video. <laughs> and he, I'm like, wow, I can't, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm very excited because, yeah, Mike Lacona at least, uh, again, disagree with him on 90% of stuff because he has some really bad takes. But at least he's being historically, when he has his historian hat on, he's historically accurate. If you've seen him debate uh, Matt Dillahunty where he was talking about floating trash cans as evidence of the resurrection, not so much. But <laughs> anyway... Yeah, I have a lot of respect for some of the things I've heard him say, but like right here, all the evidence is contrary to it. And I think that's natural, though, for a Christian to deny accepting the Gospels as myth or as being not completely true or good evidence, you know, to use. So Right. And to be clear, when I when I say myth, uh, you know, I'm meaning uh, legendary, as in right. there, there may well be a dude named Yeshua who this was based on, just like there might have been a Johnny Appleseed, we don't know, or a Paul Bunyan. Um, what we're saying is that the stories grew around either a person or, or an idea. So that's what we mean by myth, or I do when I'm talking about it. Yeah, Dennis R. MacDonald, his book, Mythologizing Jesus. There was a guy, these were possible real movements going on, and they enhanced and tweaked and whitewashed and did their thing and mythologized right. it. So right. yeah, instead of it being complete fiction, I understand where you're coming from. 
All right, coming back to it. And right. we're going to get into some of this interesting stuff Gary Habermas has to say and on. Uh, other than that, though. First, the inference is mistaken. Oh. Suppose <laughs> that Jesus only appeared to Peter and to Paul. How would that show that the gospel accounts are legendary fictions? It wouldn't show that at all. Yes, it's pedantically true for one who wants to miss the point. In my hypothetical, everything in the gospels other than the resurrection accounts could be entirely accurate. Jesus may well have walked on water, for example. If not for the character limits placed on my question, I'd likely have specified that within the hypothetical construct, it's the resurrection appearances, in particular, in the Gospels and Creeds. They couldn't be accurate as they are, as they include witnesses other than Peter and Paul. All the other scholars understood that we're talking about resurrection appearances here, but that insight didn't stop them from providing Gospels and Creeds as examples of things that aren't Gospels and Creeds. It's only you know, asked we have, for instance... Did that make sense to you? Did my question make sense? Like, I, I understand it with character limits, it's tough. It is tough because they they have a built-in framework already prior to coming into that kind of uh, world. So to de like divorce the Gospels, it's like anyone I know, when you start talking about like Paul, Paul's talking about this, and they automatically kind of take some of the story over automatically from the Gospels because it's all they've been immersed in for so long. It's so hard to say, what did Paul say? Not anything else. Right, right. And you're right. I, I I think that's difficult, especially when you're posing it to Christians who live and regurgitate. Well, Matthew and then John five seventeen, and then and they do that. They do that in yeah. this video. You prove your point because you're like without the Gospels, just this, and they go straight to the Gospels. They over and over and over quoting many of the Gospels, but they try to to wrestle with your question somewhat. Well, hypotheticals but are tricky. I find for evangelicals, and probably were for me when I was an evangelical. I just you know don't know it. But, you know, yeah, just exactly what you said. Taking a hypothetical scenario kind of wrecks what they already presuppose. So it was tough. Anyway, that was what I was trying. I was trying to put forth a hypothetical. Right. Where all we know for sure is that Peter and, Peter and Paul saw visions because I accept that there's reasonable evidence that they believed they did. So, and that's where I was trying to build from there. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, let's see how this goes. The creed in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5. You've got the appearance to Peter. He also appeared to the 12. Then to more than 500 at one time. Then to James, the half-brother of Jesus. Then to all the apostles and then to Paul. Yeah, this is the creed, the specific creed that made me say, other than gospels and creeds, what do we have? <laughs> so other than this, which reflects merely what early Christians believed, but would have to be mistaken about under my hypothesis. Number four, five, six, and seven are the Gospels. What part of other than the Gospels says, hey, let's list all the Gospels. In Mark, Mark knows that he's going to appear to them in Galilee as a group. That took some very precise wording. The author of Mark has a character promising that Jesus would later appear to the disciples, but does not include those appearances to pay off the foreshadowing. Peter... You can pause and yeah. the traditional view. So, I mean, for those unfamiliar with the Gospels, as, as much as sort of I've studied them for, for all this time, um, the weird thing about Mark is that the ending of Mark that is in most people's Gospels, if you look at the footnote uh, in 16, I believe it's verse 9 to the end, uh, the oldest and most reliable manuscripts don't include that portion of Mark. Most Christians will affirm, and it's in your Bible, that those verses probably weren't original. So when you take those verses off, there are no resurrection appearances in Mark, which is unanimously considered to be the, the first one written. So when someone like me comes along and says, yeah, it sure seems like this was a growing legend, when the very first gospel we have doesn't have appearances, and then the appearances get more and more elaborate chronologically as the, the books come along, it's just this weird quirk. And I was calling Mike out on basically saying, um, and, and appearances inferred later on or er, earlier on, um, that's him reading into the text based on Matthew, Luke, uh, and John, you know, the, the people who just had Mark the first time would have never read it that way. So that's interesting that you, you point that out. And I mean, <clears throat> that's, uh, some upcoming debate I have going to have between Dr. Richard Carrier and Dr. Dennis R. McDonald on his mm. mythologizing Jesus. 
Dr. McDonald's going to take the position that it's a growing myth, a legend developed with a man. And uh, of course, you know, Dr. Carrier's position. Yep. And so this is going to be cool to see the two because I'm seeing a growing development idea making a lot of sense. And I didn't know that. Like I told you, I was fundamentalist Christian. Yeah. Then I went like hardcore mythicist. And then I went, hold on, hold on. There's, there's more to this. So, well, Derek, I assume that you were like me when you were a, a evangelical Christian, you probably actually really believed in a fifth gospel that doesn't exist. And that's the one where we harmonize everything about the four into one story like on yes. Christmas we have we have the shepherds and the wise men and they go to Egypt and we're like we all I think I believed even though I studied them in this fifth gospel that doesn't really exist it's our own harmonization of it so it's it's like our own mental diatessaron so to speak you know right. the, it, it, we just made our own little it, it all connects no and then the argument of like the there was two women and there was three well th that's all that they remember recall that they needed to know it didn't contradict and we always fix the problems the exactly. best we could and yeah. and i'm not saying even that these harmonizations are necessarily unnatural in some places some places that's fine but it's funny that no individual gospel author actually says the thing that we christians tend to believe so good point yep good point is that he, his witness stands behind the Gospel of Mark. Well, I don't think there's sufficient evidence to accept the tradition that the author of Mark based his narration on the witness of Peter. Dr. Craig makes an interesting point. If Mark had described an appearance to Peter, it would in no way contradict my hypothetical. It would match entirely. But since Mark doesn't actually contain any appearances, let's move on. You've got in Matthew, Jesus appears to the women folk on the way back from the tomb. He appears to all the male disciples out in Galilee. Another gospel. But let's make note of the stories. In Luke, <laughs> you've got um, appearances to the 11, and then you have the Emmaus, or to Peter, to the Emmaus disciples. Another gospel. More stories. Different ones. Uh, in John, you've got the appearance to Mary Magdalene. Probably the rest of the women involved. We could we could discuss that if you want. Um, then you've got the appearance to all but Judas, and then you've got the appearance to all, including Judas. Then you've got the appearance to seven disciples on the uh, Sea of Galilee. So more stories. Last gospel. Who got through it? And the <laughs> that, was, that was a pain in the butt. Yeah, I I believe. Man, that that's exactly what I was thinking. And, and I, my point early on makes perfect sense here. I was just like, they had to go into the Gospels. There's yep. no, and they always will. I mean, because they don't, even though you have a hypothetical, I understand that they can't divorce it. They can't just, I mean, they can, don't get me wrong. If you really pin it down and you said, hey, and you had time to just, can you make an argument from only these sources? And, uh, but they don't allow that hypothetical to be true. The same way you hear stuff all the time with arguments um, what is it? Cosmic skeptic, or I can't remember the gentleman's name, uh, but he does, he, he does similar stuff where he's going in and talking about Frank Turek and Frank Turek can't take hypotheticals. No. The question is a false question. And it's like, not necessarily. You just don't believe that that hypothetical is the case. So, right. Exactly. Yeah. Frank's the worst. <laughs> Sorry, but that I had to pause and let everybody know we're through the gospel somewhat. Right. They're going to still bring them up, but independently attested in John and Luke. Multiply attested in John and Luke? None of these individual resurrection stories are repeated in any second source. You've got multiple independent accounts, at least from Matthew, Luke, and John, because you've got a recurrent attestation, and then Paul. This is the equivalent of having a suspect tell police that he spent the day with friends. They check with friend number one, who reports the group were all together on a road trip to Vegas. Friend number two reports that the group hung out indoors playing video games. Now, do the friends independently attest to the suspect's alibi? Should we be concerned about the differences? Should we harmonize them? Maybe they did both? I mean, this couldn't be further from the point of the challenge itself. But to pretend that non-overlapping stories attest to each other? is stretching credulity beyond what is reasonable. As I said that, before, that these multiple yeah, independent... Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did you want to comment on that? Well, I would want to say is, you know, we're looking at these eight floating stories here, and, like, they're not... None of them are the same story. So, like, again, it's... 
I, I didn't realize this till after I was a Christian, but like there are no details that overlap in the different gospels, which is kind of what you'd expect if each gospel writer was making up their own, if they were growing the legend in their own direction. If, if this all came, if these resurrection appearances came from a common tradition, you'd think there would be elements of these stories that overlapped and they just, they just don't. And another interesting thing I think is important when you start using the Gospels, the synoptic Gospels problem, there's mm -hmm. a problem there for a reason to act like independent attestation. I mean, there could be a case that John is using uh, primitive these previous Gospels as well to help build his own uh, stories, if you will. And I mean, like, like we know Luke, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that Matthew's using Mark Luke's yep. using both. I think there's some good evidence to suggest this and John may have all three. And, and, and then of course, where he's taken his direction, it, it, that's, I think a possible case. Absolutely. Well, even my, you, you spoke of Mike Lacona earlier. He actually now kind of holds that position that John would have had access to Matthew, Mark and Luke. You know, it would have been ridiculous for him not to. So even the scholars in the field support what you just said. How can you still like, well, cognitive dissonance must play a role in terms of like how that would weigh in and discredit, you know, how can you use that as separate attestation? Like this is, you're using another literary device. You're you, how do you know he didn't just use that device for his own purpose instead of. It's also a difference between a scholar and an apologist. Like, like Kona is new to this apologist game. He spent his life being a scholar. And so he's being intellectually honest about what the evidence can show. Whereas, you know, the Jay Warner Wallace's and Lee Strobel's of the world, they're not coming from a scholarly background. They were a cop and a reporter. So, you know, <laughs> they're just going <laughs> to go with the evangelical story. So does it, again, uh, this is where I kind of learned, oh, I should not be listening to the pop apologists. I should be finding out what the scholars in the field, even the believers, uh, will admit and acknowledge about the problems of the sources. Absolutely. Yep. Traditions behind the gospel stories that also show that this isn't correct. Dr. Craig, none of these accounts overlap in the first place. No. To appeal to some kind of independent traditions behind them as additional attestation is to admit both that there are degrees of separation between the events and the writer while simultaneously trying to sell the idea that a fourth-hand rumor is somehow more reliable than a first-hand report because there were more people involved. You know, what more are you looking for here? Well, that's literally my question. <laughs> is there more? I'm not commenting about the sufficiency or reliability of the Gospels and creeds. I'm asking if there's anything more than the Gospels and creeds. We have Peter in Acts. Yep, my question had Peter already. And he gets up right there in Jerusalem a few weeks after the resurrection and says um, uh, that God raised us, Jesus, to which we're all. Do you see how he's just while he's doing it? He's like, I don't know, man, but I can relate to that as a Christian when I was like, and I mean, it's so obvious the gospel's true. You just got to <laughs> see. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. what's. <laughs> uh, I'm with you. I felt the same way. Is Why isn't this obvious to everybody? Yeah. And I still I feel to, that way with the opposite side. So I used to love Lee Strobel, man. I actually used to love this guy's work. And I didn't know he had mistakes. There are Christians who jab at his work. Ian Mills, Laura Robinson, and stuff. Yep. They tear it up. So yeah, he's not good. Go somewhere else, even if you're a Christian. Mm. Eyewitnesses. Yep. The Peter of my hypothetical would certainly explain that. You have Paul, who himself was an eyewitness. You do. Almost as if the hypothetical already said that Paul was an eyewitness. He may well have known about the empty tomb and the post-mortem appearance of Jesus even before his conversion on the road to Damascus. So not to nitpick, but he may well have known is not technically evidence. More of a hypothetical, kind of like my hypothetical. I would say even if it was just Peter and Paul, I think we have a reason to trust Paul's testimony. Yes, if we posit that Paul was an actual eyewitness, then we could have reason to believe he was a witness. I got to stop there for a second. And this is important. Okay, this is where it comes down to like, I was reading Galatians and I thought to myself, why, why do you believe Paul? Like, why do you trust him? And I'm not saying it's not, don't get me wrong. He could have had a hallucination, some type of... Uh, experience people experience stuff all the time but why are we believing his words 
You know what I'm saying? So that's like a big thing. It, we have to just go out and go on and say, okay, let's accept that he's being honest and telling the truth. You know? Well, you, you, no one has to, but the, I like to pose these hypotheticals to Christians as even if we do, what can we build out of that? Uh, I'm not, I don't advocate that Paul necessarily, uh, what he was writing was true at all, but I like to, you know, again, I like to try to build a broader base as possible and accept as many facts as, as are reasonable. And I, I think I, anyway, I'm not, I'm not advocating that everyone needs to believe Paul. So exactly like you said, why are we believing this guy who clearly had visions and lots of weird ideas? And if we are to believe that he did some spin 180 from murdering people to getting put into prison, like what's potentially psychologically going on there? Is this who we want to build our stuff around? You know, there's <laughs> lots of problems. Yeah. But he's my but he's my namesake, so I'll you know I'll go with it. We'll go with Paul. Yeah. Witness. Anything new? And then we have at a minimum Polycarp and Clement um, from sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating what the disciples tell them. Okay, finally something new on the board. Polycarp and Clement. Let's hear more about them. Clement who was um, uh, ordained by Peter himself. That sounds promising. Sadly, we have no record from Clement himself that indicates that he knew Peter at all. This ordination idea is from a 9th century list of popes. But we can grant this tradition for the sake of this discussion. It would then mean that Clement knew one of the true eyewitnesses. Right in the first century, he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church um, so talking about the confidence the disciples had because of the resurrection. Okay. So Mr. Schrobel is talking about chapter 42 of Clement's letter to the Corinthians. Sadly, this passage doesn't specify which apostles were preaching the Gospels, so any guess about which would really just be a guess. It says these men were fully assured by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which again is somewhat ambiguous. Were they eyewitnesses or were they just super convinced by the resurrection? In the very same sentence, these men also had full assurance by the Holy <laughs> Ghost, which <laughs> doesn't imply physically witnessing the Holy Ghost, just having that internal feeling of confidence. No, this vague illusion doesn't do anything to push against my scenario. How about That's why I'm important. And this then why it's important for everyone to look at like I advocate source methodology, right? Like it's like, right. okay, someone just made a claim, pause the video, put a bookmark in the book, go find the thing they're talking about. And does it say what they say it's saying? And I say the same about my videos. Like if I'm quoting something, please go look at the book, look at the paragraphs around it. Does it really say what I'm trying to say? Cause no one should take me as an authority either. Um, again, we're just going to take Lee Strobel's word. Oh, they, these guys knew each other. Well, neither men said they knew each other. Uh, the 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 verse says that uh, they were witnesses. No, it doesn't. It says the Holy Spirit told them it was true. Like, again, I don't know about you, but a lot of people in my life believed a lot of things because the Holy Spirit told them it was true. Um, there were a lot of people on both sides of this latest election who said that the Holy Spirit told them that either person was going to win. Um <laughs> I, we, we still don't know, but half of the people are going to be wrong. Look at Paula White. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even want to start on that. But you so see. The favorite thing I've done, my, my, most, my most proud moment maybe right now is forwarding that to the Gregory Brothers who make song videos. And they're now making a Paula White song video, which is just my favorite thing. So if I don't know if it'll be out by the time it airs. Check out uh, Shmo Yoho. That Paula White thing is bananas. Anyway. That is hilarious. Yep. Who was uh, appointed Bishop of Smyrna by John. Um, he sat under the teachings of the, he certainly knew John. Yeah, he, he did. Did he though? Polycarp himself claims no such thing. That's just a later tradition. He wrote a letter to the Philippians in which he mentions the resurrection no fewer than five times. And, and he says they had confidence because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a pretty short letter. So I read it over in a few different translations, just to be sure. While he talked about Jesus being raised, at no point in the letter does Polycarp make reference to anyone at all being an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus. He does say that if anyone denies the resurrection, that they are the firstborn of Satan. But that doesn't contradict my hypothetical. 
It's entirely consistent with it. Sorry, Mr. Strobel. Plus Paul's own firsthand experience with the 12th when he visited Jerusalem um, in AD 36. He interviews Peter and James. And then before the book of Interviews. First Thessalonians is written, so still pre-canonical, he goes to Jerusalem again. And this time, Peter, James, and John are there. Then you got Paul, of course, he's there. Well, now maybe we're getting somewhere. Evidence in Galatians, one of the uncontested letters of Paul, called this because there's no serious debate against it being a genuine letter from the Apostle Paul. Since I too am convinced that it was written by Paul, and Paul is one of the men in the hypothetical who actually saw Jesus, I should be taking this seriously. If we accept Dr. Craig's dates, Jesus was killed around 30 AD. Paul's first visit to Jerusalem was around 36 AD, meeting Peter and James. The text itself specifies that the second visit was 14 years later to meet Peter, James, and John. Then, somewhere around 52 AD, Paul is writing 1 Corinthians, where he includes a creed that mentions Peter, James, and John, that's the four biggest, most influential names in the early church, and two of the names are not on the list here. It says, what about Peter and Paul? Okay, what about James and John? How could I put forth a hypothetical that would place Paul in the position of coming to believe that James and John saw a resurrected Jesus when really they didn't, even after he had a chance to talk to them about it face to face? Is my idea dead in the water? It's just, it's just so so let me let me read uh, some of this stuff I, I had written you and we okay. can go into some of this because Gary Habermas is on the scene. So Gary Habermas emphasizes the notion that Paul allegedly interviewed Peter and James Galatians mm. 118 and went to Jerusalem to talk about the gospel with James, Peter and John Galatians 2 2. He put strict conditions on what a discussion of the gospel necessarily involved details about the death and resurrection of Jesus. He says the resurrection is an indispensable portion of the gospel. In fact, he can't even imagine a meeting where Paul and the other apostles didn't discuss things like what Jesus looked like. Paul Agia, you, pushed hmm. back on this, clarifying that Paul merely visited Peter to get acquainted with him in Galatians 1.18, not to interview him about biographical details. He also clarifies that the meeting with James and John only took place on Paul's second visit to Jerusalem. This interpretation hinges on a Greek term which gives us our word for history. It roughly means something along the lines of to meet with someone, but Habermas interprets it to mean to interview, while Paul from Pologia, you, interprets it as to get acquainted with. One major Greek lexicon called bidag, for short, suggests that the verb basically means to visit, but it adds that such a visit is for the purpose of coming to know someone or something. So it seems like the term itself is actually rather ambiguous in terms of the nature of the visitation. One clue we get regarding the issue discussed during Paul's second visit to Jerusalem in Galatians 2 is that Paul's gospel is focused on the issue of circumcision, a key disagreement between Paul and and the Jerusalem church. So there seemed to be two competing interpretation of these events. One, either Paul was interviewing the original apostles to get more information about the historical Jesus that he wasn't already privy to, or two, Paul was visiting the original apostles to discuss current affairs, namely his new revelation about never revelations, sorry, about circumcision and the Gentiles. So why are apologists so keen on pushing the interpretation that Paul was interviewing the apostles about the historical Jesus? Paul explicitly says that he gets information directly from the boss himself and not from any man. Are apologists seeking to ground Paul's experience in human tradition because they lack faith in Paul's divine revelations from the risen Christ? I mean, it, it's a good question, you know. It's a good question, and I also want everyone to realize, like you pulled, so you, um, you just, I, I totally agree with everything you said there. The the thing you said about him receiving the gospel from Jesus himself, that's not out of context. That's literally four verses before he talks about his interview with with Peter. I'm just going to read it very briefly, please. So Galatians one eleven, it says, "I want you to know, brothers and sisters, this is Paul speaking." that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it from revelation from Jesus Christ. This is immediately before he talks to Peter. So this seems to me, even when I was a Christian, I was like, doesn't this say that Paul is saying that what 
Peter and those guys told me had no effect on me. I had my own idea in my head before I got there. Uh, That's what it sounds like. It sure sounds like to me, uh, these men added nothing to my message is literally in there. So it's like, I don't like, yeah, like you say, Gary's interpretation is the, is maybe my interpretation is very worldview centric, but so is the opposite interpretation to say that they harmonize this stuff. When this whole section is about Paul clashing with Peter, not agree. Yes. You, okay, this is important. I, I can't stress this. When I was a Christian, I couldn't imagine Paul and Peter being real enemies. I could see them getting in an argument. I could see there being issues, you know, once in a blue, like people try to explain that. And Acts tries to paint over that. Acts is trying to cover it up. So does Second Peter. Uh, and we know that Second Peter's a forgery and yep. it's late in the game. Acts, anyone who has any wits about them that isn't, you know, stuck in the circle of thinking, this is actually literally written in the time that it's being written, uh, or it seems like it's written. Like, say, like if we looked at a uh, historiography, you know, uh, we trust what the text is saying when it's written, sure. then, then you would be stuck in the narrative and say, Oh, this is really being written. Uh, the Jews are being kicked out of Jerusalem around this time. This is really when this was written. We have good reason to see anachronisms and things that show later dating. And so why would the church want to paint this over? I mean, it sounds like competing sects are trying to merge and create a unified orthodox position or something to try and uh, lessen the tensions between these two guys. And that's this whole thing. Paul's not sounding very happy. Paul is no. not happy with the Galatians. He's not happy with his experience with these other apostles. You can see it. It's it's obvious. So where right. is this harmonization and, and making this a good old? He went there. They they had a kosher mill. He told him about <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah. It was an amazing time. What? It's just not being honest with what's going on here. Well, it's not impossible, but it certainly isn't evidence. You're certainly bringing as much hypothetical to the scenario as mine is. Right. Yeah, I mean... Paul's saying he got his gospel from no man. This is in Galatians 1.11. Now, yep. is this prior to the first visit, or is this prior to the second visit that he makes this statement? So that's prior to the first visit, because the first visit is in verse 18, just a couple of things later, and the second visit is in chapter 2. So unless Paul is writing wildly out of chronology, you know, he seems to be stepping through his, how, his chronology of how he came to meet Jesus and get all of his re revelations of things he wrote. So uh, to argue, I've never heard anyone argue that that was from after the visit. Yeah. I was just thinking out loud, you know, I mean, he yeah. is, he, he is writing this after the things happened, sure. but um, either way that that's an interesting thing to consider because in my mind, if I'm going to play the benefit of the doubt here, Paul seems to know about the gospel. Okay. In my, in my mind, it seems like he knows about Jesus. All right, he, why is he going to Jerusalem if he doesn't already know about the movement, doesn't already know about this character? Well, he seems... Uh -huh. this certainly post whatever, whatever happened to him on Damascus Road, and I don't think Acts accurately depicts that, but whatever happened to him, this is definitely after that. Yeah, he claims to have been a persecutor of the church and then yeah. flip-flops. So if he did... I think he knew of this movement, knew of the stuff, but he ends up getting a new revelation, it seems. So yeah. his whole going there in the first initial place, why would he say, I did not receive this? Then he goes there to try and receive something from them. It, this does not make sense to me, you know? No, I think if you, if you read it straightforward, these men didn't get along and he didn't adopt any of Peter's preaching. Simply. All right. I'm going to play it for you. Or Ron, show us in the comments. Yeah. Let us know what you think. Yeah. I, I really want to know. I'm going to fast forward this a little sure. bit here. Uh, do 1.5. So I hope people can. Do you think they can keep up with that? I like to listen to everything double. So I'm, I'm good. Whew, double. Wow. All right. Here we go. Surprise that Paul went to talk about the Gospels. Well, hold on now. That's the second visit. For the first visit, Paul says he went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter. Get acquainted sounds pretty casual, right? They hung out for 15 days, getting to know each other. <laughs> Keep in mind that in my hypothetical, both Peter and Paul actually saw the really real risen Jesus. So they would have had a lot to talk about with each other. But what of James? The other pillar Dr. Habermas fears I'm ignoring. Paul's first visit description continues. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother, which he follows up with, I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Paul really wants everyone to be super clear that he didn't see anyone other than James. 
You'd probably have a chance to talk to James or just set eyes on him across a courtyard with a gentle nod. We can make guesses, but that's just adding speculation to the text. What we know is that at some point, Paul laid eyes on James, the brother of Jesus. The other thing we can know is that the reason Paul includes this story at all is to emphasize a point. The gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Sure, Paul may have palled around with Peter and gave James a fist bump, but Paul promises that those men taught him nothing about the gospel. Paul defines the gospel several times. It always involves the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Right. So Paul received no information about the resurrection of Jesus from any man, including Peter or James, on this first visit. On the second visit, Paul does seem to want to do some fact-checking. But now we're talking at least 17 years after the death mm. of Jesus. 17 years of James and John listening to the genuine eyewitness Peter tell the story over and over, maybe even some small details changing here and there in the narration. Repeated exposure to an idea dramatically increases the formation of false memory. 17 years for James and John to be prone to suggestion and post-event contamination of the kind that can lead to outright false memories. 17 years for James and John to develop implanted memories, like in this study that gently led 25% of participants to sincerely believe they were lost in the mall as a child. 17 years for wow. James and John to misattribute Peter's memories and feelings as their own. Like this study, where one group of students would propose to a Pepsi machine on a campus walk. Another group would merely watch this happen. And yet another group told to merely imagine proposing to a Pepsi machine. In a matter of weeks, members of all three groups would come to insist that they personally were in the group that had actually proposed to the Pepsi machine. 17 years for James and John to be repeatedly recalling their time with Jesus, incorporating distorted details alongside genuine ones. As we know, humans rewrite and reshape our memories each time we access them. Yeah, I see him over there in the midst. There he is. And, and John, yeah, 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 I think I see. Could that happen? That's a known psychological phenomenon. We could go on and on about the unreliability of memory, particularly in the kind of close ranks community that early Christianity seems to have been over a long period of time. And even if we can see it a shorter period of time, like the mere few years Habermas often insists on without support, these memory effects don't necessarily take long. Studies like the Pepsi machine proposal deal in weeks, not years. By the time Paul visited Jerusalem the second time, 17 years later, James and John may well have been entirely on board with resurrection appearances, at very least sincerely believing that Peter had one, if not themselves. I can't even imagine a meeting where Paul didn't say something like, hey, I'll tell you guys what Jesus looked like to me on the road to Damascus if you tell me what Jesus looked like to you on Sunday evening. <laughs> in at least three of the resurrection appearances, those described in John 20, Luke 24, and John 21, the people didn't recognize Jesus. He had to otherwise convince them who he was. Attribute this phenomenon or motif as you will, it seems that the appearance of resurrected Jesus in these accounts didn't have to match how he looked on a pre-crucifixion Sunday evening. And Bart Ehrman... You gotta imagine, they don't recognize him at all, and yet supposedly they're talking about what he looked like? I mean, maybe you could play a funny one and say, Paul shows up and goes, listen guys, I've heard about the three times the guys didn't know what he looked like. Tell me what he looks like in case he shows up. Right. You know, like... <laughs> Wait, did he look like a Jewish man in his 30s? Like, <laughs> there's no photographs. <laughs> like, how are we describing... He had a beard? Yeah, totally had a beard. Like, it's, I don't know how this description going back and forth is going to invalidate. That's why I appreciate guys um, considering mimetic criticism. I'm not going to say it's 100% certain, sure. but looking at Dennis McDonald's work on the Homeric epics and Mark, I thought it was fascinating because he talks about the identity of Odysseus being hidden. It's kind of like a secret um not don't tell them who i am or mm -hmm. you know and only the people who do know he tells them Shh, don't 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 say nothing like keep it hidden right. that odysseus does the same thing of course when he is coming back and he's an old beggar and no one recognizes him but it's an interesting thing if you haven't looked at it mythologizing jesus by dennis mcdonald it, it shows later legends being incorporated into the gospels which is why we really should argue without them but if you make arguments with them, I can see how they can't see what you're saying and follow your argument completely. Even if they try, I'm not going to say they couldn't try to follow it. Yeah. They can't accept that. No. Um, and, I, and exactly what you said in, in Mark, Mark is all about Jesus being hush hush on the sly. And that clearly wasn't selling people several years later when John was like, everywhere he went, Jesus was like, I am God. Like the, the <laughs> opposite. So I don't see how the same eyewitnesses could come to it. That's too big a bridge too far, I guess, is the phrase. It is. It is. Continuing? Continue. He says, he says, a remarkable sentence. Where do we get closer to eyewitness testimony than Paul's recounting what he got for James and Peter? Well, this quote from Bert Ehrman is from his book, Did Jesus Exist? The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth, and is in the context of affirming that Jesus was a real person who lived. Dr. Ehrman does not suggest that this passage is useful for affirming resurrection appearances. Context is important, Dr. Habermas. I'm sure you agree. 
to me, the biggest thing Paul brings to the table is not even his appearance. The biggest thing Paul did was interview the other disciples. Yet, sadly, Paul doesn't tell us what happened in this interview. Okay, real quick comment on that with Dr. Ehrman. I, I need your thoughts. Um, sure. And I apologize for everybody. The internet is eh, it's not the best. The visuals aren't uh, the greatest. But um, what are your thoughts on that? If we're to get into Dr. Ehrman's mind, and he's yep. saying the closest thing to an eyewitness is this place in Paul. Mm -hmm. That's because he already isn't counting all the gospels as clear eyewitness testimony or anything of the sort, right? Exactly. So Dr. Ehrman is very much in the camp that the four gospels are anonymous books that we can't know who wrote them. We can maybe know things about people who wrote them, but we can't, we don't know. And it seems incredibly unlikely that they are eyewitnesses. None of them even claim to be eyewitnesses. Like you'd think if they were, they would at least claim it, right? So yes, Dr. Ehrman is setting aside the Gospels as if we're looking at is was there a historical Jesus, valuable information. So really, Paul is the closest anyone comes to being saying, my name is so-and-so, and I met Jesus. And, and even Paul can't say that. So that's what Dr. Ehrman means. Is that kind of what answer your question? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, that's why, if you want my honest opinion, that's why there are a lot of mythicists out there. You see what I'm saying? Because they're like, okay, Paul didn't actually see Jesus in the sense that uh, James would have it, it appears, right? Because or, right. or Peter, if you will, or any other sure. disciple. It seems sure. like he had a risen Christ experience, whereas one might try to argue using the Gospels, this is where it gets, or inferences in Paul to try and make a uh, interpretation on these appearances that, well, you know, if they were the original disciples, they had to have seen him like when he actually rose from the dead, like actually. Well, and it's a pity that maybe that's the case, but Paul didn't record it. So what Gary is saying, you know, what Gary is inferring in there is that they would have had that discussion. And it's too bad Paul didn't tell us. Like, if it's pity that if these were divinely inspired, that God would have known, hey, throw in a sentence about how you actually met Jesus would have been cool because then there wouldn't, we couldn't have had this argument, right? But exactly, but it doesn't happen. It would be easily solved. Yep. Dr. Habermas wants us to imagine what happened, but that's inference and conjecture, no less than the hypothetical I put forward. If we let Paul describe the meeting for himself, as for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. Some Christians <laughs> interpret they added nothing to my message to mean that Peter, James, and John must have been in agreement with Paul. But in oh my, my opinion, gosh. these first two chapters of Galatians are much more clearly read with a contempt between Peter and Paul. And I'm not alone in this interpretation. Just a few verses down, Paul says of Peter, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. <laughs> to me, that's a knockout. To me, this is, at best, an <laughs> ambiguous mess, where Paul seems to be at odds with men for whom history has left us none of their own words about what they believed or what they saw. Dr. Craig and Dr. Habermas want to imagine affirmation and harmony, but discord, false memories, and pressure to conform make my hypothetical, or virtually any scenario, just as likely, given the few words we have. This data just, it's fantastic. I think that is a pretty good, um, um, there's really good evidence. I agree. I think we have <laughs> very good evidence that the appearances were not initially confined to just two people, Peter and Paul. As a group, you listed the gospels and the creed, none of which corroborate each other on these appearances and put forth an interpretation of a meeting 17 years after the event, hypothesizing details not supported by the text that are no more plausible than my hypothesis. In fact, far less plausible if you're in any way skeptical about the supernatural. But why do I even put forth this hypothetical? It seems only Dr. McDowell had the instinct to know where I'm going with this. So for me, I don't find any compelling reason to think that this story is legendary. But let me ask you this one. We have, we have, we have a few minutes left. Yeah. Perhaps the most common objection to the resurrection is that the apostles had hallucinations. Yeah. And I know you deal with that in your book, but in academic circles, not necessarily popular circles, it's yeah. probably the most common explanation to yeah. a discount. What would be your response to the idea they had hallucinations and didn't actually yeah. see Jesus? Exactly. If all the evidence of resurrection appearances is consistent. That's a key part. I think if we just, cause we can get lost into hypotheticals and like whatnots, but if we just go into their, in their sandbox yep. and we use what you're saying without the gospels and we see Paul and we allow Peter to be the other one who had a vision or, or right. seen an appearance, you have two guys only, you don't have 500, you don't have 12 and you're going to get into that here. But I thought that was a mental exercise. I have never practiced. You know, I never thought of looking at it that way. And I thought it was a really well done thing that you did to make right. me think, because what are you actually saying? Can you can you say from your mouth what you're actually saying in this? You're saying 
this is the hypothetical. This is the potential. There were only two guys who actually claimed to actually see and the legend built and they added that more people saw it. Is this what you're suggesting? It's essentially what I'm saying. And I, I do put this forth in a bit of a seven minute video uh, that I have with how the resurrection probably happened with, uh, without a resurrection or how, how Christianity probably began without a resurrection. Um, yeah, essentially really the, if you look at it carefully and you look at it critically and you're charitable to the Christian side, even we, we could say that Paul, as you said, Paul definitely saw something and we'll pick Peter as the guy who also probably saw something, even though we don't have in his own words that he did. We just don't because we don't think first and second Peter were written by Peter. And even if we do accept that, frankly, in first and second Peter, it doesn't say that he saw resurrected Jesus either. So uh, let me set that aside. I got in the weeds, just like you didn't want me to do. The, <laughs> the, the essence of it is, can we explain the church, which for me is the piece that no one can dispute? The church exists. Somehow this movement started. You have to acknowledge that this movement started and that it grew and that it blossomed into what we see now. Like that's kind of indisputable. So that's the piece that I have to explain if I'm going to be a real skeptic. That's a piece of undeniable evidence. But can we explain it from one guy having some kind of post-hallucination uh, vision? And I kind of say that because Christianity obviously grew before Paul came on the scene uh, to some extent, even if it's mm -hmm. better followers. Um, and then, you know, obviously the New Testament is anchored on Paul's vision, which he says is a vision. He says he doesn't know if it was in real life or in the seventh heaven. He doesn't, he can't even himself quantify this. So can we explain the church based on just those two people? And honestly, no one, I've yet to have anyone put forth some piece of data. Well, it started in Jerusalem. Fine. Jeez, you know, Peter was in Jerusalem. Well, it flourished here fine we, we you know we can also accept that paul was there like there's just no piece of data or you know or the the gospels exist well sure the gospels exist because these legends grew and other men who spoke greek not aramaic wrote them down like it's just think about it critically does is there anything that we can't explain with my hypothesis that there was just two people and because two people in in you know five years apart could each have had their own some sort of event that's not implausible. Like uh, Strobel wants to laugh off. Well, 500 people can't have the same vision. Well, I don't say that they did. I say that Peter did. And then five years later, Paul did, you know, th then you're no longer in absurdity land because, you know, I put up some of those studies. There's a lot of studies about what happens to people when they either feel really guilty about something like Paul would have, or if they have a recent death, uh, as Peter would have, that suddenly becomes pretty reasonable, if not plausible, at least reasonable as something to consider. So I get to see anything you can't anchor on those two facts. I'm waiting for it. Put it in the comments if you have it, but that hell, maybe I made it worse. No, no, no. That's interesting. I, and one of the things I like to do is to like to rabbit trail hypotheticals based off of, but I think Occam's razor, if we give the benefit of the doubt with what you're saying, I think that two men, it appears Paul does know of a movement of people prior to him that believe in something. We don't know what they believe. That's the thing where I start right. getting into weird stuff, because what if the notion of, of resurrection, and, and this is why I think Occam's razor does support the idea that they believed in some form of maybe resurrection. Um, I could be wrong, but it sounds like Paul thinks that these guys he comes to visit already had a gospel, a different type one, of course, to the circumcision. So he supports the notion that they have something here. But there was a gentleman I interviewed on my show. He had an interesting slant here. He said that um, Paul's argument of, of the resurrected Christ is rooted in the idea that you don't need to circumcise, right? So you're not putting yourself as a slave under the law. Yep. And so... You have to divorce that from Jews because it's to the Gentiles and this gets complicated, but he made an argument where he said he thinks that Paul's gospel is a resurrection Jesus, whereas whoever these previous guys were, they didn't have that kind of gospel. 
But then what do you do with 1 Corinthians 15, which is obviously creedal, though? So when is that written? Is that really written around the time later during time Paul's still alive? Is there interpolation there if you give the benefit of the doubt? You know, what do you do with it? So 1 Corinthians, the trouble is 1 Corinthians 15, not just the first verses that are creed, the entire chapter, and it's his longest chapter, is entirely about resurrection. And it ends with, um, you know, if Christ has not been raised, our, pe our preaching is futile and so is our faith. We are to be pitied above all men. Um, you know, that's a huge long section that no one has come across and said, this is a different style or this is, you know, again, I'm just, I don't speak Greek, so I don't know. But, you know, if I'm li listening to the scholars, I haven't seen anyone seriously put forth that the entire chapter is interpolation. So, um, but we certainly know that there were many sects of Christianity before Paul came on the scene. There were the Gnostics who had one view um, and obviously, uh, I'm blanking on some of the others, but there's, you know, this proto-Orthodox people, um, that were, could have been in Peter's line. Like the Christians didn't agree on whether Jesus was fully divine, fully human. Like there was different. So that those early years, there was every idea under the sun. You can find some writing that supports almost anything. So I'm with you. We don't know before Paul came on the scene, he kind of solidified it and codified what we see now. So we assume that that was the one true branch, but it wasn't the only branch. And we don't know which one Peter upheld, frankly. It's an interesting question. And, and, and we don't have evidence to help support anything beyond right. that. And it's, we just go with the, we can play in the sandbox and work with it. So right. I enjoy that. Here we go. I'm going to go ahead and play. Oh, sorry. All I was going to say was, you know, all you have to do is look at Thessalonians, which I don't think was written by Paul, but Thessalonians warns against all these other fake documents that were out there. So either a fake document was warning about other fake documents or a real document was warning against an array of fake documents and, and fighting against those exact ideas. So they existed. There, it yeah. wasn't unified. It wasn't unified. Mm -mm. That's all. Awesome. And with, and can be fully explained with just Peter and Paul as the only actual eyewitnesses to resurrected Jesus, then it is automatically true that all the evidence can be fully explained with Peter and Paul being sincerely mistaken about what they saw. Even to the person themselves, sincerely mistaken is indistinguishable from sincerely correct. My name is Scott. Gotta Hanks. have the ad in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just listen. <laughs> this is my wife. Oh, and, and, and we could talk about that ad. <laughs> We could even talk about the damn ads that we get. I get all these like Jews and Israel ads on my stuff, man. <laughs> I'll take yeah. their money. Pure Flix likes to advertise on my stuff. So, okay, okay, well, take their money. They won't, they're not convincing anybody with their Kevin Sorbo movies. <laughs> oh. Great dreams. They happen in individual minds. So you I can't, can't wake, wake your my spouse wife up in the middle of the night. Say, hey, honey, I'm, I'm having a great dream. dream. I'm in my life. Go back to the same dream. We'll save vacation. all the airfare. We'll save all the hotel. You we can't, can't do, do that. that. 500 people having the same hallucination at the same time will be a bigger miracle than the rest you, of you, you, you comment on that real quick, though, that, that they oh, were what, both. What the people just saw there, uh, I like to be weird with my editing, but the two men on separate streams gave almost word for word the same example of why group hallucinations can't work. They were discussing their wife waking them up from a dream and that, you know, that the wife would have known and honey joined me in the dream. It's just so funny to me that these apologist scripts are so similar that at normal speed, I could put them side by side and their timing almost matched. Wow. Like, you know, so again, apologists borrow from each other liberally. Uh, when you watch as much as I do, you start to see the patterns and don't watch as much as I do. I don't know. <laughs> it makes me think of the synoptic problem, except this is Ooh, the right. apologist problem. We can show they have the same source, or at least one is borrowing from the other for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. This is interesting. <laughs> it sounds like Dr. Lycona and Mr. Scroble. We don't have 500. We have a story that there were 500. No evidence has been given for an actual witness other than Peter and Paul. This is the point. We don't need to explain 500. We don't need to explain 12. We need to explain two. Two people who had entirely different experiences years apart. Perhaps one with the common phenomenon of post-bereavement hallucination experiences, and one with common post-traumatic guilt symptoms. And we're done. This non sequitur about group hallucinations mm. is entirely a non sequitur. Until You're going to have to comment on that. You got to comment on that. So you have one is like a loved one you, you experience after they die, someone close to you in, in that kind of uh, psychological uh, right. experience. It, Right, and certainly one can look up the studies on post bereavement, uh, post bereavement syndrome, basically, and it happens to fifteen percent of people. 
It gets even higher the older you are. Um, and it's anything from I got the sense of the person was still in the room with me to it can be multimodal. It can be like I saw them or I heard them. Like, um, And so, and it typically happens. Uh, the, the more disappointed and unexpected the person passed away, it tends to happen even more. Um, and they're, and in this, the modern studies of it, these are not people that had history of mental issues at all. Like it's across the board. It's just a kind of a natural thing. And, and what people press against back against me is, is that generally after some period of time, the people kind of let it go. They, they, they don't keep having these visions, but nor did Peter. Peter had this very convincing, if, if, if I'm correct and that that's what he experienced, it was very convincing to him as it is for all these other people. Um, if, so, if I could add to that, Paul, that I think would be valuable is that this isn't just a loved one, right? This isn't the, their part, they're involved in a very, um, I don't mean cult and derogatory, but they're involved in an apocalyptic messianic cult where they do think the end is near. I mean, there's a, that is a well-known established thing that's going on here in this time that apocalypticism is a thing. And these guys are Jewish apocalyptic. It appears people who anticipate the end. So they're looking for signs. They're hoping for answers. And this might have been what solidified such a movement on top of other events occurring that they would say only God could do that. This is, this right. shows that he was the one and they can't let it go. Now they built a legend around this and therefore it's not like my mom passed away and I experienced her. And then, you know, I gradually let go over time. No, there's religion built together with it, you know? Right. And uh, I don't know when this will air and I don't know what will be happening in America at that point, but all you have to do is look around uh, and see the people who are supporters of the current president, number 45, um, are certainly so desperate. I'm not saying like there's anything wrong with what they're saying, but they are, they are very, their emotions are high. Oh yeah. So, so, you know, just like you can see that kind of height of emotion, imagine, you know, that height of emotion, if you were personally you know, connected with this man, just like you said, they walked around with him for three years and they had every political hope in the world pinned on that person. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, yeah, that those 12 were invested. You now, what about Paul? You made a, made a comment about Paul. Paul feels guilty. Uh, right. He was beating up the church and uh, or at least in some sense, persecuting whatever that means, uh, you know. Right. Well, it's not uncommon. And this is where I need Chen and Q to help me with some of these psychological uh, things <laughs> that often help me with these things. But, uh, you know, it's quite common for people to experience 180s in their life, right? Like they're all down one road and on a dime, boom, they flip to the other. And it's generally, I shouldn't say generally, but one of the things that can do this is guilt, right? So I was drunk. I was, you know, beating my kids. I was whatever was happening. And suddenly you you get this realization of what you're doing. And then it's not like, oh, I gradually changed. It's this boom 180. Um, and certainly the way Paul describes what he was doing, if he was, he said he's breathing up murderous threats. Now, if that meant that he was actually murdering Christians, you can imagine as a man of the Sanhedrin, like his Old Testament would have told him, do not murder. Now, he would have probably thought these were righteous murders, but at some point, if you are, persecuting and jailing and beating and killing people your fellow jews at, at some point it seems not unlikely that you might think what am i doing right like they just believed in a different messiah than i did and for uh an, an appearance of the a man giving him an excuse this vision of jesus would have given him an excuse to obey his conscience rather than the letter of the law he was thinking of and Again, if you look at my video, uh, the, the study I put up, there's this is well documented. This is a kind of thing that happens to people who are whose lifestyle doesn't fit with what their conscience does. They do these quick 180 flips and they find some way to justify it to themselves. And so I'm not saying that's what happened to Paul. I don't think we can psychoanalyze characters like this because we can't know, but certainly it's plausible. Certainly we know it happens. It happens today. And again, it's not because of mental illness. Um, it's it's in the same family of problems of PTSD, right? When, when soldiers go to war. These are very strong uh, men and women who go to war generally. They're mentally tough. They've been trained to be that way. And yet they still experience this kind of post-traumatic stuff from things that they see. 
how are we going to, we, we can't rule out that Paul have the same kind of experience. So these are two very reasonable, natural explanations in my view. I'm not putting forth that this definitely happened, but to call them unreasonable, like Lee Strobel's kind of laughing off, I think that's dismissing stuff on your own bias, not properly accepting the hypothetical. I agree with you. I, I do. I think that makes a lot of sense, especially with the data we have. If he really was yep. killing or persecuting to a point of death um, some of these people, there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of weight that could be carried there. So good point. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll finish out this video and we'll have our closing uh, good. here. So. <laughs> of evidence for a group of people experiencing something, which you don't. This is a, a hypothesis that has virtually nothing to commend it. That's your opinion, Dr. Craig, but perhaps I've given my viewers something to think about. I laid out my full, how Christianity probably began, no resurrection required scenario, in this short video. And let me know in the comments if you agree, or where I've gone wrong. See you there. Love that little uh, music you have for the intro outro, man. Yeah, that's actually the hymn. Uh, it's an Irish version of the hymn uh, In Christ Alone, which was one of my favorite hymns when I was uh, when I was a Christian. So it's, it's this weird uh, throwback again to make people make everything welcoming to the people I would like to speak to. <laughs> well, it does have a great welcome. And then you watch <laughs> it and you're like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Guys, if you haven't seen Paul Apologia, if you haven't seen his channel, please go and subscribe, hit that bell, get notified. You will not be let down. It is super entertaining. Always well done. He puts a lot of time into these videos that he's editing. And as you can see, the quality is really good. This hasn't been the best quality, then again, my internet's kind of eh, and yeah. I've been my best. I mean, you got really blurry at times, and uh -oh. I, I can't help it. Uh, the internet, I've got a house full of kids, man, and uh, <laughs> they're all on stuff. And I try to kick them off, but I can't help it. Um, but I, I do hope to see more um, come from you. Continue doing what you're doing. You. Uh, you really deserve way more subscribers than what you have. I mean, you really, I know it's growing, and it takes time. But uh, I can already see you ending up way up there man uh easy three four hundred thousand subscribers like big channel that's going to happen especially with the quality of your content and uh i like the way you think it makes me think differently than what i'm used to thinking and i well, want a lot more than subscribers so that's great right i mean you got you got a lot of that well the bigger you get with that content the more people you'll influence and i know that uh you you've got that gentleness about you too <laughs> so well, i'm canadian so Oh, that's it. That's that's, that's yeah. really the answer. You said enough. I had an Irish uh, guy come on recently, and everybody could tell he's uh, he's just an intense guy, you know. So, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> um, Paul, thank you so much for joining me, man. It was a I pleasure, really Derek. And uh, yeah, they, some great questions, great insights, and this is I I love talking about this stuff. So this is a real pleasure. Let's do this again sometime. Sure. I would love to do the one on the independent gospels because <laughs> that right there, dude, I was laughing. I had to laugh. Michael oh, Lacona. Yeah. Right, the the Jay Warner Wallace versus Mike Lacona one. Let's do it, man. If you Sounds get the time, I'll put it on. How about this? I'll put it 20, on 1.5 speed next time. Yeah, yeah. We, from the get go, and we'll make uh, it quick. Yeah, fortunately, I think the rest of my year's tied up, and we, we all can't wait for this year to be done. So, start a 2021, book me in. Okay. Yeah. And we'll, and maybe by then I'll choose a different video. Who knows? Maybe <laughs> we'll do something different. All right. Maybe we'll do something. So, with that cool. being said, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching Myth Vision Podcast. If you guys haven't figured it out, go down in the description. Go check out his Patreon. Go check out his PayPal. Help support him. Get a shirt. He's got some t shirts. He's got Teespring. We're going to have that at some point when I break 10,000 subscribers. And don't forget, we are Myth Vision. <laughs>